Welcome back to Croato and Science, where I go back on literally everything I just said, saying that I wasn't just going to do medical, and we're going to talk about something medical today, known as antibiotic resistance. So what is antibiotic resistance? Why is it so common right now to be talking about it? Well, except for, you know, this virus that's going around, which has nothing to do with antibiotics, but trust me, there's still way scarier stuff out there. So getting back onto antibiotic resistance, where does it come from? How does it form? What are we doing about it right now? And what can be done to kind of slow it down? Well, let's talk about that in today's episode. So in the 1920s, a British scientist by the name of Alexander Fleming actually discovered something that would be game changing for the human race. Now, ever since day one, we've been getting our butt kicked by bacteria, just really any diseases that come around. We have an immune system, but take something like Yersinia pestis, which is the plague. This disease ransacked Europe and about a third of the people there estimated lost their lives to this bacterial infection. Today, when you catch the plague, you take some antibiotics, you're good to go. No problem at all. So Alexander Fleming was working with a specific bacteria known as Staphylococcus aureus. When he left for the weekend, he came back and realized that the Petri dish that he was working with was contaminated with mold. This particular mold seemed to degrade the colonies around it. And when this happened, he had the idea of, well, that's kind of strange. So he continued working with it. In 1928, he officially named it penicillin. It was known to degrade colonies and it was beginning to be used as more of like a medicine for more medical purposes if anybody had a bacterial infection. In 1941, it was founded that if given in a small amount, it could basically cure everybody of their bacterial infections, stop wounds from festering, basically all the important things to keep your body parts. And considering that we were in World War II at this point and people were fighting, uh, diseases going around, new biomes mixing with newer biomes, just some stuff that, you know, is definitely a breeding ground for bacteria. It became massively important to be used and actually it saved a lot of lives in the war. So everyone was pretty jazzed about this new miracle drug. It worked on everything and stopped anyone from getting sick. So it was given for everything. If you had a viral infection, you were still given penicillin. If you had a cough, you were given penicillin. If you scratched your arm, you were given penicillin. And over time, penicillin was working less and less. So because penicillin wasn't working as well as it had worked before, new antibiotics began to crop up into the field and those seemed to work even better. So penicillin is still given pretty regularly, uh, but you know, as newer antibiotics were discovered and it began to be known that actually you could have uh, allergic reactions to penicillin, which can stop your heart. These became more favorable. So over time, about between, you know, the 40s and 80s, penicillin and other antibiotics were given for literally everything under the sun. Now, that was the biggest issue. Doctors didn't really know about resistances back then. They just knew that it worked and it would also make patients feel better if they go in, they're sick, the doctor just gives them something and hey, look, I, I, I feel better in a couple days. It must have been the antibiotics when it could have been just something as simple as your immune system continuing to fight. So basically an overprescription of antibiotics kind of leads us to where we are today. So with these resistances popping up, especially in 2020, it is known that antibiotics, they're not infallible. Bacteria actually develops resistance to it quite readily and it can be for a couple of reasons. So let's cover those two reasons real quick. Literally a couple of reasons. The first reason that it might actually develop antibiotic resistance is just from a random mutation. Now, life isn't stagnant. Literally, all life is is just reacting to your environment if you really think about it. So let's say that you are a bacterial cell and you would not like to be destroyed by penicillin. Well, we know penicillin will lyse bacteria by destroying the cellular membrane. So what do you do? Well, if you change the structuring of your actual linkages within that cellular membrane, congratulations, penicillin no longer works on you, which is exactly what's happening. So imagine if you will, those linkages kind of like this, right? Well, what it does is it kind of goes and fits in that linkage. And when it goes and fits in that linkage, the next piece of the cellular membrane can't actually link correctly to it. When that happens, uh, the cell lyses and it just spills its contents. Well, what the bacteria will do is with that linkage specifically, it'll put like a bump right here so that the antibiotic can no longer fit within that. And when it does that, it's able to become resistant to that actual antibiotic. And this can be actually acquired through genetic mutations, which is about one in 10 million 
And if you've ever seen bacteria grow, one in 10 million, it's not really that much. And what happens is it almost creates an artificial environment of selection. So when you have one in 10 million cells resistant to penicillin, odds are one of those cells is eventually gonna make it. And when it does, that becomes the one that starts spreading and reproducing and any of the other ones that are susceptible do not anymore. Most people are actually colonized with Staphylococcal aureus. It's pretty common to find it on people. Now, if you're taking penicillin, you're killing off the susceptible ones and leaving the resistant ones. And eventually that leads us into the actual resistance known as MRSA, which is methicillin resistant Staphylococcal aureus. What that does is methicillin is actually a derivative of penicillin. It was made because penicillin was no longer working. And then we tried using methicillin, which worked for a while, but now methicillin is no longer working as well. So it became MRSA, but scarily enough, we're actually on Versa, if you didn't know. Vancomycin resistant Staphylococcal aureus. This is essentially a very powerful antibiotic and it's our last line of defense so far. It's been a couple of years, but uh, it, yeah, it, we're already seeing resistances to it, which doesn't bode well. So as mentioned, you know, you can get it through this random mutation, which happens, or you can get it by sharing plasmids and genetic information. So bacteria have at its disposal something called conjugation. And conjugation is where one cell can literally take a conjug <laughs> conjugating tube, essentially, and put it into another cell. And then they can exchange genetic information. And if one is susceptible and the other is resistant, well, congratulations, now they're both resistant because they pass along that information. But bacteria also have the ability to pick up genetic information from the outside of them. So if a cell is ruptured, which happens with bacteria, the genetic information is then sent out. And here's why this is kind of a, uh, an issue. We know for a fact that bacteria that is lysed with penicillin, the genetic information is probably still okay. And it's, they also have essentially floating genetic information called plasmids. Plasmids are where a lot of antibiotic resistance come from. So when that cell is lysed, these plasmids and genetic coding are then like they just leak out into the surrounding environment, which who's in the surrounding environment? Probably other bacteria because they exist within these colonies and these colonies are pretty tightly packed. So they're able to pick up these plasmids. And when they pick up these plasmids and also the literal genetic information from this bacteria that was lysed, they may be able to pick up some sort of resistance from it. And over time, like I said, it's almost like a artificial selection process with this happening with, with us giving antibiotics to everything, this creates a continuous environment where these resistances can continue to be picked up and formed, which leads us to where we are now. So where are we right now? Well, a lot of our bacteria is becoming antibiotic resistant at an alarming rate. It almost seems like as we form new antibiotics, it only takes a little while for those resistances to start showing up. And we're making the bacteria stronger in the process. It's not like our bodies can't overcome a bacterial infection, but there is a reason the entire human history is riddled with corpses because of infections. Like we don't look at them that badly anymore. We, we think viruses are the real threat, but no, bacteria is a major threat. This is why the CDC continuously is monitoring these levels of resistances and making recommendations based on it. And I know the CDC is not popular right now, but they do a lot of good work. But one of the interesting things is in life, if you don't need something, you don't keep something, right? And there's a reason uh, humans don't have like 12 limbs because we don't need 12 limbs. It just wouldn't make sense. With bacteria specifically, they can lose their resistances. In fact, I have personally seen a loss of resistance in MRSA to penicillin. Very strange that it would work again, but we stopped using penicillin as much, and now we're seeing penicillin actually work again. Those same cells are resistant to vancomycin, which is a much more powerful antibiotic. So over time, these genetic mutations that arise for their environment can be lost, degraded, once again through random mutations, and because they're not under selective pressure from their environment. And because of this, we actually see that it is possible that we can move on from a bacteria that is resistant to everything. And as we stop treating it, 
it loses those resistances. So what do we do? Now, uh, I am just a lowly microbiologist, but from what I've seen in the lab and what I've seen in general, our best option could potentially be antibiotic rotation. We need to stop utilizing certain antibiotics for a while to let overall resistances go down, and then we can use it again. We've almost, you can almost consider it like this. If you take a field, right, and you plant the same crop every single year, eventually, that field is going to become barren, right? It won't support anything because all the nutrients are gone, which is why we have something called crop rotation. In crop rotation, you pick a new plot of land and that lets the original crop area kind of recover after it's been harvested. Same idea with antibiotics. And this is not something that I'm not gonna take credit for it. It's something that I could see working, especially considering that we have penicillin working on MRSA resistant bacteria, but Again, this takes a while. So if you're gonna take an antibiotic out of the game entirely, you're gonna miss that antibiotic. I mean, it's gonna suck, especially if other things become resistant to everything you got. You're gonna to wanna to throw it back in rotation. But this is just an idea as far as how might we overcome resistance. Another way that we're trying to overcome resistance to bacteria is just not giving antibiotics for everything. Crazy idea, right? If you don't give antibiotics for every cold or cough or just to make people feel better, you know, even if it's a placebo effect, well then, you know, there's no bacteria there to become resistant or there is bacteria there to become resistant, but there's no antibiotics to become resistant to, which stops the spread of resistance. So there are a couple things that we're doing to try to mitigate this issue. Uh, if you are kind of concerned about the future of antibiotics, well, jump on board because we all are. It's not like we're in the end game yet with it. Uh, we still have plenty of time. We can make new antibiotics, although it is becoming more difficult. And we can kind of course correct by not administering antibiotics for everything. Or, you know, one of the big things that's actually been really helpful is testing to see if it's a virus or a bacteria because there's no point in administering antibiotics to someone with a virus. It's just not gonna do anything. So anyways, I'm gonna wrap this up here before I start to ramble. And some of you may have already thought I've been rambling the whole time, which I, you know, I'm very passionate about antibiotic resistance because uh, eventually I'm gonna get some infections and I want something that's gonna work against it. But I wanna hear what you think about it in the comments. Uh, do you think we're just totally screwed or do you not think that we're not totally screwed? My game plan with it is we need to start developing uh, more aggressive forms. Whereas penicillin is nature and antibiotics are nature, let's start developing nanites. That way we can just totally cut those things in half and congratulations, the bacteria is gone. Anyways, I appreciate you guys watching. Let me know what you thought down in the comments about my scientific rambling here. And I will see everyone in the next one. Thanks guys.